We will continue argument this morning in case number 11393, National Federation of Independent Business versus Sibelius, and case 11400, Florida versus the Department of HHS. Mr. Clement. Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the Court, if the individual mandate is unconstitutional, then the rest of the Act cannot stand. As Congress found and the Federal Government concedes, the community rating and guaranteed issue provisions of the Act cannot stand without the individual mandate. Congress found that the individual mandate was essential to their operation. And not only can guaranteed issue and community rating not stand, not operate in the manner that Congress intended, they would actually counteract Congress's basic goal of providing patient protection but also affordable care. You can, if you do not have the individual mandate to force people into the market, then community rating and guaranteed issue will cause the cost of premiums to skyrocket. We can debate the order of magnitude of that, but we can't debate that the direction will be upward. We also can't Counsel, debate. That may well be true. The economists are going back and forth on that issue, and the figures vary from up 10 percent to up 30. Uh, we're not in the habit of doing the legislative findings. What we do know is that for those states that found prices increasing, that they found various solutions to that. In one instance, in, we might or may not say that it's unconstitutional, Massachusetts passed the mandatory coverage provision. But others adjusted some of the other provisions. Why shouldn't we let Congress do that if, in fact, the economists prove, some of the economists prove right, that prices will spiral? What's wrong with leaving it to in the hands of the people who should be fixing this, not us? Well, a couple of questions, a couple of responses, Justice Sotomayor. First of all, I think that it's very relevant here that Congress had before it, as examples, some of the states that had tried to impose guaranteed issue and community rating uh, and did not impose an individual mandate. And Congress rejected that model. So your question is quite right in the saying that it's not impossible to have guaranteed issue and community rating without an individual mandate. But it's a model that Congress looked at it and specifically rejected. And then, of course, there's Congress's own finding. And their finding, of course, this is finding I, which is 43A of the government's brief in the appendix. Congress specifically found that having the individual mandate is essential to the operation of guaranteed issue and community rating. That's so, all it said it was essential to. I mean, I'm looking at it. Um, the exchanges, the state exchanges, are information gathering facilities that tell insurers what the various policies actually mean. And that has proven to be a cost saver in many of the states who have tried it. So why should we be striking down a cost saver well, when, if what your argument is, was that Congress was concerned about costs rising? Well, why I, should I, we assume they wouldn't have passed an information? I, I think a couple of things. One, you get, I mean, I, I would think you sort of have to take the bitter with the sweet. And if Congress, if we're going to look at Congress's goal of providing patient protection but also affordable care, we can't, I, I don't think it works to just take the things that save money and, and cut out the things that are going to make premiums more expensive. But at a I minimum. I bottom line is why don't we let Congress fix it? Well, I, let me answer the bottom line question, which is no matter what you do in this case, at some point, there's going to be, if you strike down the mandate, there's going to be something for Congress to do. The question is really, what task do you want to give Congress? Do you want to give Congress the task of fixing the statute after something has been taken out, especially a provision at the heart? Or do you want to give Congress the task of fixing health care? And I think it would be better in this we're situation. Not taking, if we strike down one provision, we're not taking that power away from Congress. Congress could look at it without the mandatory coverage provision and say, this model doesn't work, let's start from the beginning. Well, or it could choose to fix what it has. We're not. Declaring one portion doesn't force Congress into any path. 
And, 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 and of course that's right, Justice Sotomayor. And no matter what you do here, Congress will have the options available. So if you, if you strike down only the individual mandate, Congress could say the next day, well, that's the last thing we ever wanted to do, so we're going to strike down the rest of the statute immediately and then try to fix the problem. So whatever you do, Congress is going to have options. The question There's is — There's such a thing as legislative inertia, isn't there? Well, that's exactly what I was going to say, Justice Scalia, which is I think the question for this Court is we all recognize there's legislative inertia. And then the question is, what's the best result in light of that reality? And — Suggesting that we should take on more power to the Court. No, I — Congress would choose to take one path rather than another. That, that sort of taking on to the Court more power than — one, I think, would want. And, and, and I agree. We're simply asking this Court to take on straight on the idea of the basic remedial inquiry into severability, which looks to the intent of the Congress that passed yeah, Well, do you have a view about that? Why, why do we look to the in- — you sure we look to the intent of the Congress? I thought that, you know, sometimes Congress says uh, that these provisions will — all the provisions of this Act will be severable. And we ignore that when the act really won't work, when the remaining provisions just won't work. Now, how can you square that reality with the proposition that what we're looking for here is what would this Congress have wanted? Well, two responses, Justice Scalia. Well, you can look at this Court's cases on severability, and they all formulate the test a little bit differently. Yeah, they but sure every do. one of them talks about congressional intent. But here's the, here's the other answer. That's true, but is it right? It is right. And here's how I would answer your question, which is, when Congress includes a severability clause, it's addressing the issue in the abstract. It doesn't say, Boy, no matter which provisions you strike down, we absolutely positively want what's left. All right. The, the, the consequence of your proposition, would Congress have enacted it without this provision? Okay, that's, that's the, the consequence. That would mean that if we struck down nothing in, in this legislation, but the, uh, what's it called, the corn husker kickback, okay, we, we find that to violate the, the constitutional proscription of venality, okay? <laughs> when, when we strike that down, it's clear that Congress would not have passed it without that. It, it was, it, it was uh, the means of getting the last necessary vote in the Senate. And you're telling us that the whole statute would fall because the, 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 the corn husker kickback is bad. That can't be right. Well, Justice Scalia, I think it can be, which is to say the, the basic proposition, that it's congressional intent that governs. Now, everybody on this Court has a slightly different way of divining legislative intent. And I would suggest the one common ground among every member of this Court, as I understand it, is you start with the text. Everybody can agree with it. So, that. Mr. Clement, let's start with the text. And you suggest, and I think that there's, this is right, that there is a textual basis for saying that the guarantee issue and the community rating provisions are tied to the mandate. And you, you pointed to where uh, that was in the findings. Is there a textual basis for anything else? Because I've been unable to find one. It seems to me that if you look at the text... The sharp dividing line is between guarantee issue community ratings on the one hand, everything else on the other. Well, Justice Kagan, I'd be delighted to take you through my my view of the text and why there are other things that have to fall. The first place I'd ask you to look is finding J, which is on the same page, 43A. And as I read that, that's a finding that the individual mandate is essential to the operation of the exchanges. But there are other links between guaranteed issue and community rating and the exchanges. And there, I think, it's just the the way that the exchanges are supposed to work, and the text makes this clear, is they're supposed to provide a market where people can compare community-rated insurance. That's what makes the exchanges function. Although the exchanges function perfectly well in Utah, where there is no mandates. They function differently, but they function. And the question is always, does Congress want half half a loaf? Is half a loaf better than no loaf? And on something like the exchanges, it seems to me a perfect example where half a loaf is better than no loaf. The exchanges will do something. They won't do everything that Congress envisioned. Well, Justice Kagan, I think there are situations where half a loaf is actually worse, 
and I want to address that, but before I — more broadly, but before I do that, if I can stick with just the exchanges, I do think the question that this Court is supposed to ask is not just whether they can limp along and they can operate independently, but whether they operate in the manner that Congress intended. And that's where I think the exchanges really fall down, because the vision of the exchanges was that if you got out of this c- current situation where health insurance is basically individualized priced based on individualized underwriting, and you provide community rating, then it's going to be very easy for people to see, okay, well, this is a silver policy, and this is a bronze policy, and this is a gold policy, and we can, you know, I can just pick which insurer provides what I think is going to be the best service based on those comparable provisions. Mr. Clement, you just said something which you say a lot in your brief. You say the question is um, the manner in which it would have operated. Um, And I think that that's not consistent with our cases. And I guess the best example would be Booker, where we decided not to uh, sever provisions, uh, notwithstanding that the sentencing guidelines clearly operate in a different manner now than they did uh, when Congress passed them. They operate as advisory rather than mandatory. Well, but Justice Kagan, I I mean, I actually think Booker supports our point as well, because there there are two aspects of the remedial holding of Booker. And the first part of it, which I think actually very much supports our point, is where the majority rejects the approach of the dissent, which actually would have required nothing in the statute to have been struck, not a single word. But nonetheless, this Court said, boy, if you do that, then all of the sentencing is basically going to be done by a combination of the juries and the prosecutors and the judges are going to be cut out. And the Court said the one thing we know is that's not the manner in which Congress thought that this should operate. Now, later, they make a different judgment about the — which particular provisions to cut out. But I do think Booker's consistent with this way of looking at it, certainly consistent with Brock, the opinion that we're, we rely on, because there, the Court only reached that part of the opinion after they'd already found that the must-hire provision operated functionally independent from the legislative veto. Mr. So, Mr. Mr. Clement, there are so many things in this Act um, that — are unquestionably okay. I think you would concede that that reauthorizing what is it, the Indian Health Care Improvement Act, changes to the black lung benefits. Why may Congress redo those? I mean, it's a question of whether we say everything you did is no good. Now I start from scratch, or to say, yeah, there there are many things in it that have nothing to do, frankly, with the the affordable health care. And there are some that uh, we think it's better to let Congress to decide whether it wants them in or out. So why shouldn't we say it's a choice between a wrecking operation, which is what you are requesting, or a salvage job? And the more conservative approach would be salvage rather than throwing out everything. Well, Justice Ginsburg, two kinds of responses to that. One, I do think there are some provisions that I would identify as being at the periphery of this statute. And I'll admit that the the case for severing those is perhaps the the, the strongest. But I do think it's fundamentally different, because if if, if we were in here arguing that some provision on the periphery of the statute, like the Biosimilars Act or some of the provisions that you've mentioned, was unconstitutional, I think you'd strike it down and you wouldn't even think hard about severability. What makes this different is that the provisions that have constitutional difficulties or are tied at the hip to those provisions that have the constitutional difficulty are the very heart of this act. And then if you look at how they are textually interconnected with the exchanges, which are then connected to the tax credits, which are also connected to the employer mandates, which is also connected to some of the revenue offsets, which is also connected to Medicaid, if you follow that through, what you end up with at the end of that process is just sort of a hollow shell. And at that point, I think there is a strong argument for not — I mean, we can't possibly think that Congress would have passed that hollow shell without the heart Well, but it would, have, it would have passed parts of the hollow shell. I mean, you're, a lot of this is reauthorization of appropriations that have been reauthorized for the previous five or ten years. And it was just more convenient for Congress to throw it in in the middle of the 2,700 pages uh, uh, than to do it separately. Uh, I mean, can you really suggest — I mean, they cite the Black Lung Benefits Act, and those have nothing to do with any of the things we're talking about. Well, Mr. Chief Justice, you know, they, they, they tried to make them germane, but I'm not here to tell you that, you know, some of their — surely there are provisions that are just looking for the next legislative vehicle that's going to make it across the finish line, and somebody's going to attach it to anything that's moving. I, I mean, I'll admit that. But the question is, when everything else from the center of the Act 
is interconnected and has to go, if you follow me that far, then the question is, would you keep this hollowed-out shell? But I'm still not sure what is the test, and this was a colloquy you had with Justice Scalia with the Cornhusker hypothetical. So I, I need to know what standard you're asking me to apply. Is it whether, as a rational matter, the separate parts could still function, or does it focus on the intent of the Congress? If, if you suppose you had uh, Party A wants proposal number one, Party B wants proposal number two, completely unrelated. One is airline rates, the other is milk regulation. Um, and, 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 we, and they, they, they decide them together, the procedural rules of these have to be voted on as one. They're both passed. Then one's declared unconstitutional. The other can operate completely independently. Now, we know the Congress would not have intended to pass one without the other. Is that the end of it? Or is there some different test? Because we don't want to go into legislative history. That's intrusive. So we ask whether or not an objective, as an objective, rational matter, one could function with that. I still don't know what the test is that, that we're supposed to apply. And this is the same question as Justice Scalia. Sure. Could you give me some help in that? Sure. Question? Justice Kennedy, the reality is I think this Court's opinions have at various times applied both strains of the analysis. And which one and what test do you suggest that we follow if we want to clarify our jurisprudence? I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm a big believer in objective tests, Justice Kennedy. I'd be perfectly happy with you to apply a more textually based objective approach. I think there are certain justices that are more inclined to take more of a peek at legislative history, and I think if you look at the legislative history of this, it would only fortify the conclusion that you would reach from a very objective textual inquiry. But I'm happy to focus the Court on the objective textual inquiry. I don't and, understand. and that objective test is what? That is, is whether the statute can operate in the manner that Congress, the, that Congress intended. And, I mean, it, I, no I, statute I, can do that, because it, once we chop off a piece of it, by definition, it's not the statute Congress passed. So it has to be something more than that. Justice Sotomayor, every one of your cases, if you have a formulation for severability, if you interpret it woodenly, it becomes tautological. And Justice Blackmun addressed this in footnote 7 of the Brock opinion that we rely on, where he says, of course it's not just, you know, it doesn't operate exactly in the manner because it doesn't have all the pieces. But you still make an inquiry as to whether, I mean, when, when Congress links two provisions together and one really won't so work without the other. So what's wrong with the presumption that our law says, which is we presume that Congress would want to set? Wouldn't that be in a, the simplest, most objective test, going past what Justice Scalia says we have done, okay? Get rid of legislative intent altogether, which some of our colleagues in other contexts have promoted, and just say, unless Congress tells us directly it's not severable, we shouldn't sever. We should let them fix their problems. I, I, you still haven't asked, well, you answered me, why in a democracy structured like ours, where each branch does different things, why we should involve the court in making the legislative judgment? Justice Sotomayor, let me try to answer the specific question and then answer the big picture question. The, the specific question is, I mean, you could do that. You could adopt a new rule now that basically says, look, we sever. It's not a new rule. We presume. We've oh, but, but, rebutted the presumption in some cases, but right, some but what, would call that Judicial action. I think in fairness, though, Justice Sotomayor, to get to the point you're, you're wanting to get to, you'd have to ratchet up that presumption a couple of ticks on the scale. But, and, and because and the one what's thing. What's wrong with that? What's, well, what, one thing that's wrong with that, which is still at a smaller level, is that's inconsistent with virtually every statement in every one of your severability opinions, which all talk about congressional intent. Well, it's not but, inconsistent with our practice, right, Mr. Clement? I mean, you have to go back decades and decades and decades, and I'm not sure even then you could find a piece of legislation that we refused to sever uh, uh, for this reason. Well, I don't think that's right, Justice Kagan. I mean, I think there are more recent examples. A great example, I think, which sort of proves, and maybe is a segue to get to my broader point, is a case that involves a state statute, not a federal statute, but I don't think anything turns on that, is Randall against Sorrell, where this Court struck down various provisions of the Vermont campaign finance law, but there were other contribution provisions that were, were not touched by the theory that the Court used to strike down the contribution limits. But this Court, at the end of the opinion, said, we're, you know, there's no way to think that the Vermont legislator would want these handful of provisions there on the contribution side, so we'll strike down the whole thing. And if I could make the broader point, I mean, I think the reason it makes sense 
in a democracy with separation of powers to in some cases sever the whole thing is because sometimes a half a loaf is worse. And a great example, if I dare say so, is Buckley. In Buckley, this court looked at a statute that tried to, in a coherent way, strike down limits on contributions and closely related expenditures. This court struck down the ban on expenditures, left the contribution ban in place, and for four decades, Congress has tried to fix what's left of the statute, largely unsuccessfully, whereas it would have, I think, worked much better from a democratic and separation of power standpoint if the court would have said, look, expenditures are, you can't limit expenditures under the Constitution. The contribution provisions joined at the hip. Give Congress a chance to actually fix the problem, it's not just fix it. Can I ask you one question, which is a practical question? I take as a given your answer to Justice Kennedy. You're saying, let's look at it objectively and say, would Congress have intended this, okay? This is the mandate and the, the community. This is Titles I and II, the mandate, the community uh, pre-existing condition, okay? Here's the rest of it. You know, and when I look through the rest of it, I have all kinds of stuff in there. And I haven't read every word of that, I promise. All right, I mean, as you pointed out, there's biosimilarity, there's breastfeeding, there's promoting uh, 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 nurses and doctors to serve underserved areas, there's the class act, etc. What do you suggest we do? I mean, should we appoint a special master with an instruction? Should we go back to the district court? Uh, uh, you haven't argued most of these. As I hear you now, you're pretty close to the SG. I well, mean, you'd I like it all struck down, but if we're supposed to apply uh, uh, the objective test, uh, I don't know if you differ very much. So what do you propose that we do other than spend a year reading all this and have you argue all? Right. What, what, what I would propose is the following, Justice Breyer, is you follow the argument this far, and then you ask yourself whether what you have left is a hollowed-out shell or what well, I would say the Breastfeeding Act, the, the uh, 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 getting doctors to serve underserved areas, uh, the biosimilar thing in, in drug regulation, uh, the Class Act, those have nothing to do uh, with the stuff that we're, we've been talking about yesterday and the day before. Okay? So if you add, tell me at that level, I'd say, sure, they have nothing to do with it. They could stand on their own. Uh, the Indian thing about uh, helping the underserved uh, uh, Native Americans, uh, uh, all that stuff has nothing to do with it. Black lung disease, nothing to do with it. Okay? So that's, you, you know what you have there? A total off-the-cuff impression. So that's why I'm asking you, what should I do? What you should do is, 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 is let me say the following, which is follow me this far, which is the mandatory individual mandate is tied, as the government suggests, to guaranteed issue and community rating. But the individual mandate, guaranteed issue, and community rating together are the heart of this act. They what, they're what make the exchanges work. The exchanges, in turn, are critical to the tax credits because the amount of the tax credit is keyed to the amount of the, the policy price on the exchange. The exchanges are also keyed to the employer mandate because the employer mandate becomes imposed on an employer if one of the employees gets insurance on the exchanges. But it doesn't stop there. Look at the Medicare provision for DISH hospitals, okay? These are hospitals that, sh that serve a disproportionate share of the needy. This isn't in Title I. It's in the other part that you had in your other hand. But it doesn't work without the mandate, community rating, and guaranteed issue. Well, can and I ask you this, Mr. Clement? If, sure. What would your fallback position be if, if we don't accept the proposition that if the mandate is declared unconstitutional, the rest of the Act, every single provision has to fall? Other uh, — Proposed other dispositions have been proposed. There's the Solicitor General's disposition, the recommended disposition, strike down the guaranteed issue and community rating uh, provisions. Uh, one of the one amicus says strike down all of Title I. Another one says strike down all of Title I and Title II. What, what, what would you suggest? Well, I, I think what I would suggest, Justice Alito, I don't want to be unresponsive, is that you sort of follow the argument through and figure out what in the core of the Act falls. And then I guess my fallback would be if what's left is a hollowed-out shell, you could just leave that standing. Um, if you want a sort of practical answer, I mean, I do think you could just, you know, you could use Justice Breyer's off the cuff as a starting point and basically say, you know, Title I and a handful of related provisions that are very closely related to that are, are really the heart of the act. The, the well, bigger volume on the other hand, I mean, you could strike one and leave the other, but at a certain point, I'm sorry, Mr. Chief Justice. Finish your certain oh, no, point. At a certain point, I just think that, you know, the better answer might be to say, we've struck the heart of this act. Let's just give Congress a clean slate. If it's so easy 
to have that other big volume get reenacted. They can do it in a couple of days. It won't be a big deal. If it's not, because it's very contra – well, but, I mean, you can laugh at me if you want, but the point is I'd rather suspect that it won't be easy, because I rather suspect that if you actually dug into that, there'd be something that was quite controversial in there and couldn't be passed quickly. But the, the and that's reality, sort of the whole point. The reality of the passage, I mean, this was a piece of legislation which there was – had to be a concerted effort to gather enough votes so that it could be passed. And I suspect with a lot of these miscellaneous provisions that Justice Breyer was talking about, that was the price of a vote. Put in the Indian health care uh, provision and I will vote for the other 2,700 pages. Put in the black lung provision and I'll go along with it. Uh, that's why uh, all uh, – many of these provisions, I think, were put in, not because they were unobjectionable. So presumably what Congress would have done is they wouldn't have been able to put together, cobble together the votes to get it through. Well, maybe that's right, Mr. Chief Justice, and I don't want to spend all my time on fighting over the periphery, because I do think there are some provisions that I think you would make as, as an exercise of your own judgment, the judgment that once you've gotten rid of the core provisions of this Act, that you would then decide to let the periphery fall with it. But if you want to keep the periphery, that's fine. What I think is important, though, as to the core provisions of the Act, which aren't just the mandate, community rating, and guaranteed issue, but include the exchanges, the tax credit, Medicare and Medicaid. As to all of that, I think you do want to strike it all down to avoid a redux of Buckley. If I could reserve the remainder of my time. Thank you, Mr. Clement. Mr. Needler. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the Court. There should be no occasion for the Court in this case to consider issues of severability because, as we argue, the, 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 the um, minimum coverage provision is fully consistent with Article I of the Constitution. But if the Court were to conclude otherwise, it should reject petitioners' sweeping proposition that the entire Act must fall if this one provision is held unconstitutional. As an initial matter, we believe the Court should not even consider that question. The vast majority of the provisions of this Act do not even apply to the petitioners, but instead apply to millions of citizens and businesses who are not before the Court. How does your proposal actually work? Your idea is that, well, they can take care of it themselves later. I mean, do you contemplate them bringing litigation? and saying, I guess the insurers would be the most obvious ones, without, uh, without the mandate, the whole thing falls apart and we're going to bear greater costs, and so the, the rest of the law should be struck down. And that's a whole other line of litigation? Well, I, I, I think the, the continuing validity of any particular provision would arise in litigation that would otherwise arise under that provision by parties who are is actually it, What affected. cause of action is it? I've never heard of a severability cause of action. Well, it, in, in the first place, I don't I, the, the point isn't that there has to be a, an affirmative cause of action to decide this. You could, for example, to use the, the Medicare reimbursement issues, one of the things this Act does is change Medicare reimbursement rates. Well, the, the place where someone uh, adjudicates the validity of Medicare reimbursement rates is through the special statutory review procedure for that. And the same thing is but true of the Anti-Injunction Act. There, there are some provisions which nobody would have standing to challenge. If the provision is simply an expenditure of federal money, it, it doesn't hurt anybody except the taxpayer, but the taxpayer doesn't have standing. Uh, that, that, that just continues. Even though it, 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 it is, it should, it is so closely aligned to what's been struck down that it ought to go as well. But nonetheless, that has to continue because there's nobody in the world that can challenge it. Can that possibly be the law? I think that proves our point, Justice Scalia. This Court has repeatedly said that just because there's no one may have standing to challenge, and particularly like tax credits or, or taxes, which are challenged only after going through the uh, Anti-Injunction Act, just because no one has standing doesn't mean someone must. But beyond that — But those are provisions that have been legitimately enacted. The whole issue here is whether these related provisions have been legitimately enacted or whether they are so closely allied to one that has been held to be unconstitutional that they also have not been legitimately enacted. 
uh, you, you can't compare that to, uh, to cases dealing with a, a, a statute that nobody uh, denies is, uh, is constitutional. This case is directly parallel to the Prince case, in, in our view. Uh, in that case, the Court struck down several provisions of the Brady Act, but went on to say it had no business addressing the severability of other provisions that did not apply to the people bef- uh, before the well, what, he's thinking, of, uh, what that- he's thinking of is this, I think, Justice Scalia is thinking, I suspect, of imagine a tax which says this tax in amount Y goes to purpose X, which will pay for half of purpose X. The other half will come from the exchanges somehow. That second half is unconstitutional. Purpose X can't possibly be carried out now with only half the money. Does the government just sit there collecting half the money forever because nobody can ever challenge it? You see, there, if it were inextricably connected, is it enough to say, well, we won't consider that because maybe somebody else could bring that case and then there is no one else? Yes, I we, think, th- is that, is that we think that is the proper way to proceed. Mr. 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 Mr.